Okay, I think it's finally time we tackle the power drawbar in the CNC. This isn't actually the first time we've made a power drawbar for a mill, so if you haven't watched this video, go check that out. We are gonna be doing something a bit different with this one, but before I get into the details, let's talk about how a drawbar works. Uh, first, you have some sort of collet. In our case, we're using a three quarter inch R8 collet. It's got a taper on one end with some slots and a threaded hole on the other. The drawbar pulls up the collet into the spindle taper and tightens down on whatever tool you have in the collet. Normally, this is done just by screwing down the drawbar. For our last power drawbar, we used a pneumatic impact wrench to do this. But for the CNC, we want something a little faster and more consistent. We're gonna be adding these special springs called Belleville washers. Now, they don't look like much, but they can actually apply thousands of pounds of force. With these added, instead of unscrewing and screwing in the drawbar to take out a tool, we can just press it down. This does mean we'll have to find some way of pressing down with a few thousand pounds of force, but we'll get to that. Let's talk about these washers for a second, because they're actually pretty cool. You can get them in a bunch of sizes and spring rates uh, to suit your needs, and they're not too expensive. The obvious question is, how much force do we actually need to hold onto a tool? And I'm sure this is where some of you might have a few things to say, but I'm basing all my numbers on a research paper published by Tormach. The TLDR basically comes down to about 2,700 pounds. Now, this number is based on a ton of factors like horsepower of the spindle and the size of the tool you're planning on using. But this number seems like a good one to shoot for. Now, there are a few ways we can get there. If we pop on McMaster for a second, you can see there are a ton of options for each washer and they all have their own ratings. So let's break that down. First, you have the working load. That's how much force is applied when it's compressed some. I say some because that brings us to the next number, the deflection at working load. That's how much you have to deflect the washer to get its working load force. This number is based on the washer being fully compressed, which brings us to the last rating we care about, the flat load force. This is how much force it takes to squash the washer completely flat. Let me pick one of these washers as an example to make things a little more clear. If we want a washer that can apply 2,700 pounds of force, we might pick this one because it has a working load of 2,670 pounds. This is what engineers might call close enough. But you notice we have to apply 3,200 pounds to squish the washer completely flat. When we do this, we only get about 0.051 inches of movement on the drawbar. We need about six times this much movement to easily get the tool in and out of the collet, but luckily there's an easy way to get to that. We can just stack a bunch of these washers together like this. You can say these are stacked in series. You end up with the same force, but six times the total movement. Interestingly, you can stack them in parallel and get about the same amount of movement, but six times the force. Spoiler alert, we won't end up with that magical 2,700 pounds of force on the drawbar. Due to a combination of the air cylinders I have access to and the max pressure our air compressor can put out, we end up with something closer to 2,200 pounds of force which so far seems to be enough. Now, if you thought that was a rabbit hole to dive down, wait until we actually start building and designing the mechanism to apply all that force. I'm gonna let this time lapse play while I talk about how I was doing everything completely wrong at first. You see, I'm designing this whole thing around an air cylinder I found on Amazon. It's got a four inch bore and a two inch stroke, which means it can apply about 1200 pounds of force at 100 PSI over its entire two inch stroke. We only need about a quarter inch of movement on the drawbar end, but we need almost three times that force. So we need to find a way to gear down the air cylinder. The easiest way I could think of at the time to do this was a simple lever, which would have indeed given me the force I needed, but unfortunately it would have also put all that force directly on the spindle bearings, which well, would have been bad. To avoid this, we need to find a way to essentially pinch the drawbar and the rotating part of the spindle with the air cylinder. That way the force never makes it to the bearings. This gives us two more problems to solve though. First, we have to have a way for the air cylinder, its air lines, and all its mechanical bits attached to the spinning part of the spindle without everything getting all twisted up every time you turn on the spindle. And we have to find a way to gear that cylinder down in a compact and simple way. Luckily, the second problem has already been solved for us by Fabco. They make this really sweet multi-staged air cylinder that does just that. I'll link to a few videos on how this thing works because, to be honest, I only barely understand it. But the short answer is it uses three cylinders instead of just one to get three times the power. No gearing need. 
The other problem isn't too hard to solve either. We just need to design something that basically sits out of the way when the spindle needs to spin and engage the spindle when you need to do a tool change. That might look something like this. Well, this was supposed to be a one minute intro and we're a good six minutes into it. So let's actually start building something.
I was hoping maybe we could have a little dialogue about that. All right, uh, Bianca says, that's not an interesting comment. No, but a lot of people did ask you about that 3D animation. Oh, yes. So we're going to be doing a fair bit more of that in the future. Um, it's actually what my profession is in real life. So uh, it takes a bit of effort, but it seems like it's worth doing. Yeah. And software? Oh, yeah. We're using uh, Lightwave, which any 3D artist out there is probably laughing hysterically at me right now. But <laughs> that's what I learned. That's what I know. Yeah. I'll probably switch to Blender at some point. Yeah. And of course, for the engineering stuff, we're using Fusion 360 for pretty much everything. Yep. Let's see, uh, Bernhard Paul says, boring German smoke detectors use light. Yeah, actually, I commented on that one. I guess they're basically a dust detector, which is kind of a neat thing in itself, but less radioactive. Yeah. Goober asked, where did we learn to CAD like that? You YouTube? Yeah, well, uh, some of it I definitely learned while I was working at NASA. Um, we did a lot of data visualization stuff through uh, ProE and Maya. Good humble brag. Sir Raj Nottingham III says, wow, you guys sure have come a long way from two guys in a garage welding on the floor and trying to fix heat distortion of the car. We still do those things. No, we haven't come that far, but thanks. <laughs> We've gotten a ton of questions about the specifics of the Peltiers and how we stack them and the voltages and all that. Yeah. We'll probably have to do a whole standalone video for that, so yeah. subscribe. PW says, I'm very disappointed, sir. I heard you say go watch reality TV, and I did. Huge mistake. <laughs> and my dog came and got me and told me how good your video was. He also told me I probably wouldn't understand it, but it was still really good. That's a good dog. Uh, how do you have enough time to make amazing videos, really cool projects, and watch so many other YouTubers? Oh, social life. Oh, we had several questions about galvanic corrosion with the copper and aluminum. Again, that's probably a whole video in itself, but I don't know if you guys have ever opened like an engine bay before. You've got an iron block, an aluminum head, copper fittings, and they all work together. Galvanic corrosion is a thing uh, and something to watch out for, but... Preventable. Yeah. Jacob asked, where can I find the plans for the cloud chamber? Uh, well, we put some of them up on the website. That's uh, physanon.com, and we'll down on that down under. Yeah. Okay. We're not uh, super good at documenting these builds, so they might not be complete. Uh, Tobzu says, are you going to make a Cloud42 electronic lead screw? That'd be awesome. Again, I want to do it. Ryan's not so sure. We'll see. The lead screw we have works. Totally does. Okay. Uh, HOY says, did I see a California Air Tools compressor in the back there? Uh, they get extremely hot in constant use. Yeah, that is in fact what you saw. Um, we'll keep an eye on it. I, we were planning on building a bit of an enclosure for it, so cooling may be a consideration. Yeah, but we really like it because it's very quiet. Very quiet. Uh, Nika B says, hello, touch probe type please. Do that one again, less weird. Nika B says, hello, <laughs> touch probe type please. <laughs> I asked for less weird. <laughs> Nick B says, hello, touch probe type, please. Ah, good question. We're going to cover this in more detail in a future video, but this is made by Drewtronics. Uh, you can find them on drewtronics.org. They make them in America. I think they're in Texas. No uh, sponsorship in the video or anything, but I like them. Uh, yeah, we've got one here from uh, Bianca Roman Stump. She Dude, said, this video is getting pretty long. Yeah, so you're just, right. We'll probably right. just cut it. All see right, guys. see you guys later.